Well, we hear many good news today. I mean, the kitchen is refurbished, so we're going to have our warm meals today. And it's also have been a, a good, good news that for the last nine years or so, uh, the price of our lunch had been £2.50. So that has been good news. So the better news is that now we're going to pay £3 from now onwards. <laughs> now, no restaurant, no church has been holding the same price, £2.50, for nine years. All right, you have to understand. And today, if you go to Starbucks, I checked the prices this morning. The vanilla spiced latte cost £3.20 upwards. All right, so hope that nobody would uh, feel the pinch that much. A couple of weeks ago, I saw the vendor of the Brady McAbee building, which we have exchanged contract as a permanent place uh, for Emmanuel Northwest. So we have exchanged contract, and we will complete contract, God willing, by 25th of February. And um, we will occupy the place and have our first service for the last, on the last Sunday of March. And then there will be an open day on the 20th of May, I believe 20th of May, for everybody. So when I saw the vendor, remember I told you that we were on a contract race. In other words, there was a rival bid. So I asked him, I said, is that rival bid real or not? You know, are you just trying to call a bluff? He said it was real. He said you will lose the building if you delay another two more days. So we thank God for the real timing that, we, uh, that God has given us uh, the place to expand our work of the kingdom in Edgeware. So before I start uh, this morning's sermon, let's pray. Let's ask God to be with us and bless our time together. Lord, we bless you that you are the God who moves in our midst. And uh, thank you that you are the God who reveals yourself. So that, Lord, we know that you are indeed Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the whole universe. And we ask that, Lord, you will help us, Lord, to understand as we explore the theme for this year, the fear of the Lord. Help us to get to know you more as a result of this. Open our hearts, Holy Spirit. Give us understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If the LCD team just uh, show us the first picture. Now, this picture is that of a type of stoat. Next slide, please. Which is that of a white ermine. We call it a white ermine. And what you can see is this spectacular white fur of coat with a um, tip of black at the back, uh, at the end of the tail. And uh, this poor thing, obviously being such a beautiful animal, is being hunt has been hunted for his fur. And uh, do you know who uses fur? Well, most monarchy will use that. Next slide. And you'll find that uh, they, they use it to, uh, for their coronation robes and so on. So for every blob of black on that Rope is that of, a, of an ermine. So the hunters of uh, these ermines know one of their weaknesses, and that is they're so proud of their white fur that they will not venture anywhere near to dirty their fur, of, uh, their coat of fur. So before the hunting starts, the hunters will put filth and dirt at the entrances and inside uh, what they suspect will be the, the places where the ermines live. And so when uh, the hounds were released to, to, to go after the ermines, the ermines will try to rush back to their homes and poor thing, they find that it's all covered with filth and dirt. And rather to spoil their, you know, uh, to mar their beautiful, clean fur coat, they, they rather choose to confront the dogs or the hounds than to go inside. And of course, they are no match for the dogs and so they will be killed. Well, you may say these are creatures of instinct and they may be foolish to pay the price with their lives in exchange for not sullying their beautiful fur coats. But as Christians, I ask this question, what will motivate you and me that we too are not prepared to sully our character, our integrity, defiling our bodies and our spirits what can motivate us so that we also will not choose to dirty what God has done in our lives? Will it be our reputation? Will it be our let down of our loved ones? Will it be a disappointment you know, to our cell leaders, our church, our pastors, our parents that will stop us from 
being willing to defile or let our, uh, the purity that God has done in us to be defiled. But the key actually lies in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, which is the verse that we're going to study today. It holds the key because it reads, let's read together. Uh, in the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, it reads, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is the key, the fear of God. is a way in which we continue to bring holiness to completion. That's in the English Standard Version. So this year's theme is the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. If you go further down, it says, turning a man from the snares of death. If you want life, the fear of God is the answer. But we need to know a little bit more about what does it mean to have the fear of God. And in the past few sermons, we have described what the fear of God is. First of all, the fear of God can be taught. It can, you can learn the fear of God. It is not something that we say, oh, I have the fear of God. We can continue to grow in learning to fear God. Pastor Colin talks about the fear of God is the beginning or the foundation of wisdom and knowledge. If you want to be wise in this world, then the fear of God is a secret. And we have defined that the fear of God as the reverential awe as we come before this awesome Creator who is sovereign, who is outside of time, who holds time in His hands, who is majestic, transcendent in space and time, the brilliant architect, the best musician, the best mathematician, scientist, philosopher, artist, one that's full of moral good, rich in justice, and full of steadfast love. This is the fear of God that would attract us. You know, it's like a, a, a very brilliant artist, you know, or musician. You'll be attracted because you want to listen to, to how that artist will play. In the same way, we should be attracted as we come in the presence of God. It's a bit like, I don't know how many of us have the privilege of going to uh, visit the Grand Canyon. I remember I had that opportunity one, one time uh, on a business trip, and you need to go nearer to the cliff to see, you know, the, the panoramic view of the Grand Canyon. But there is a limit beyond which you will not dare to cross, right, because you will drop over the cliff. So in the same way, the fear of God is like, you have to go near to to really appreciate, to really have that wonderment, adoration, and love, and awe of this mighty God. But of course, you cannot be over-familiar with God. And so this fear of God, or the reverential awe, is a healthy, is a very positive thing that we should seek, we should look forward to, we should always have it in our lives. Unlike some of the other types of fear, which are negative fears, fear of cancer, you know, fear of flying on the planes, you know, everything that is so self-worth, self-directed. I discovered of a new phobia uh, coined, I think, in the 20, uh, just in the last few years. It's called nomophobia, N-O-M-O phobia, nomophobia. How many of you know what is a nomophobia? I, I know you will not know. It's called the no mobile phone phobia. No, it's real. I'm not joking. I know I used to work in the mobile phone industry. It's called no more, no more phone phobia. No more phone phobia. No more phobia. And what it means is that there's that fear that you suddenly find that your phone has lost radio coverage or the battery has died and you say, oh dear, nobody's able to contact me. That fear is called the no more phobia. <laughs> but that is a very unhealthy kind of fear. But the fear of God is a healthy kind. And now we also have to understand the definition of what holiness is. What do you mean by to perfect holiness in the fear of God? What does it mean to bring holiness to completion in the fear of God? What, what is holiness? So let's understand. If you talk about holiness uh, applied to God, it means it's the entirety. It's a summation of God's perfection in all His attributes. It's the totality of who God is, of His purity, His wisdom, His power, 
His beauty, His mercy, His justice, His love. And the Hebrew word is called, uh, for holy is called kadosh, which means to cut off or to separate. It does not mean that God is cut off from us, but it means that God is separate. He is holy and other. Holy and other. You know, some people believe that God is in the microphone. You know, this is God. Every part of the universe is God. That's not true. Of course, God sustained the whole universe, but He is holy and other. And that's why the seraphim, we sang just now, Isaiah 6, they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Why? Because it is the totality of who God is. You don't say, wise, wise, wise is the Lord. No. You do not say, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful is the Lord. You do not even say, powerful, powerful, powerful is the Lord. But holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Because the word holy summarizes who God is. And God himself decreed that you or me and me, being his people, must be holy because he is holy. So what does that mean? Of course, we cannot say that we, we become like God because we are always the creature, never the creator. But the word holy, when he applies to us, means that we are to be separate. To be separate. Separate from what? Separate from the things that are opposed to God. Separate from the things that are sinful in the sight of God. And being set apart for God's service. That's why we are called holy. Not necessarily good. You know, God is still at work in our lives. Some of us have had such a bad background that there's a lot of work to be done. But God is starting a good work. But you are decreed to be holy because you are now to be kept separate. To be different from the things that are sinful. To be called to be separated from the things that are sinful. And so in this verse, it describes that being holy, being made holy, is not a one-step change. You do not suddenly become completely separated from the things that are sinful. Although, although positionally you are called a saint. All right? In other words, God puts in the Holy Spirit in us the moment we become a Christian. We are decreed to be separate from God. And God puts that fear in, in Jeremiah, I think, chapter 32. It says, God, God said, I put the fear in you so that you will not sin against me. In other words, God started that work the moment we become a Christian. But it is an ongoing process. That is why in verse, uh, the verse that we read just now, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, is that you have to bring holiness into completion. Bringing holiness into completion, perfecting holiness. It is a process. Many of us think that, you know, we, we accept Jesus, we, 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 we put up our hand at the church service, or we get baptized, or we come before the altar, we pray the sinner's prayer. That's it. Job's done. I'm a Christian. That's it. That's finished. But God says, no, that is only the first step of the many, many steps in your life. That is only the beginning of you becoming a saint in the Lord. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it reads that this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So it is the will of God that we continue to be progressively become more and more separated from the things of the world or in our flesh that are opposed to God. You understand? So if you want to know what is the will of God for you, one thing for certain is your sanctification. The, the Greek word for sanctification also has the root word, which is from the same word of holy, hagios, to be made separate, holy for God. But we ask ourselves and say, the word holy is not a very popular term, is it? Even among Christians. Do you agree? How many of you in your prayer request say, you know, pray for me to be more holy? You say, oh, pray for my health. Pray for my job. Pray for my work. But never say, pray that I may be more holy. Maybe we have this mental picture. What, to, what, to become a holy man or holy woman is, is one like a picture of a, maybe an Indian a holy man, you know, in yellow saffron robes. Or maybe for Christians, we wear white robes and we walk in a certain holy way. Very holy. We speak in a very holy way. We pray, oh Master, oh Lord. That's our holy... And definitely suffers no nomophobia. Why? Because he cannot afford the mobile phone. All the money he has has been given away to the poor. 
walking in slippers or barefooted. No wonder we do not want to say, Lord, make me a holy person. Is that correct? But do you know holiness has to do more with our inside, our heart? And your holiness is expressed, as Chuck Colson said. It is, holiness is an everyday business for Christians. And holiness shows itself in all the decisions you make, the things we do hour by hour, day by day. This is the expression of your decisions, shows you the degree of your separation from the things that are sinful against God. So when we talk about becoming, uh, bringing holiness to completion, it means that over time, we should become more and more pure morally. Not just in actions, but in, even in our thought life. You know, some of the unkind thoughts of judging people, of making unkind um, judgments of people. Those should become fewer and fewer as we become more and more holy. Now, that is a, sort of like the negative aspect. But as we become more and more holy, this also means, it also means that we, we, we become more and more obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, to do good to some people, suddenly become more aware that this is what Jesus would do. And therefore, to become more and more holy is become more and more like Jesus. And that is the aim of God. And so often we ask God for happiness. But do you know God is more concerned about your holiness than your happiness? Because happiness is just a state of your mind. But holiness is about transformation. Happiness is only but for the moment. But holiness is for eternity. And so often, we have to go through times when we say, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? I would be so happy if you have answered that prayer. But God may say, no, it is part and parcel of my sovereign plan. After all, God knows the beginning and the end. He says, this is the best for you because I am preparing you, not for the moment, but for eternity. And therefore, we need to understand that holiness is about a separation. Now, it does not mean that we live, I mean, leave this world and, and move ourselves into the monastery. No, because Jesus says you are the light of the world. You are very much part of the world in that sense. You are the salt of the earth. You have to mix yourself in among the earth. And so, and yet Jesus said, I, you know, he prayed to the Father that to protect us, that even though we are in the world, we are not of the world. So we must be very much engaged in the world. But yet we must be separated from the things that are hostile towards God. This is what holiness is all about to be separate, set apart for the master's use. So let's turn to read the, uh, the verses prior to 2 Corinthians 7.1 because we need to understand what are these promises. So let's start from 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14. Let's read that together. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, who is a false god idol? Okay? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And therefore, sorry, next slide. And therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So Paul is talking about holiness. He's talking about this need to separate ourselves from the things that are hostile to God. And, that, and we should walk towards a place where there is really no compromise. And he asks five obvious questions. He says, what has righteousness got to do with wickedness? The moment you have a spot of wickedness in righteousness, that righteousness is no longer righteousness. So it is a binary decision. Either you're righteous or you're wicked in that sense, all right? like darkness and light, can they coexist? The answer is no. 
Can there be harmony between Christ and an idol called Baileel? So the answer is no. Or the difference or the values in uh, the allegiance of a believer to, towards God and a non-believer towards God. The answer is no, because a non-believer does not acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus. Or what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? And so, so the answer is that as we progressively become more and more holy, bringing uh, holiness into perfection, we are talking about us moving away from idols. This is what Paul is saying. This whole passage is about dealing with idolatry in our lives. Of course, we do not have statues of idols coming into the church. But God says that you can have idols in your hearts. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3, God was talking to, to Ezekiel the prophet. He says, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. He's referring to some leaders coming to seek uh, Ezekiel. And he says, these men have set up idols in their hearts. And should I even let them to inquire of me? So do you know that we have idols that keep popping up in our hearts? You may not bring idols, you may not wear idols, but idols exist. I have to struggle with idols that pop up from my own heart. And what is an idol? An idol is anything. Anything that takes the place of God is an idol. And someone says that our human hearts are like idol factories. Very easy to generate idols all the time. Because as human beings, we always look for what? Purpose. We look for meaning. We look for happiness. And very often, that what God has made for us to enjoy in the first place, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, because of sin, it becomes, they become perverted, they become idols. And so instead of being servants, they become masters of our lives. And, we, and they dictate how you know, we're going to spend our energies in, to put our financial resources in, our emotional resources in, even our loyalty, our trust, our being controlled, we even give them to the idols. It's very easy to identify some of the idols, right? I mean, career can be an idol. Money, materialism, your shares, your properties can become idols. Even my grandchild can become my idol. Not careful. My wife can become an idol. Anything can become an idol. Your internet, your know, computer gaming can become an idol. Your Facebook can become an idol. Sex can become an idol. Power can become an idol. Anything can become an idol. Even Facebook can become an idol. And how do you know it's an idol? You may say, I need to keep in contact with Facebook. You know, my friends with Facebook. So how do you know it becomes an idol? It's to ask yourself, like anything that preoccupies you all the time, even times when you're resting. And if that's the thing that consumes your energy, that's the thing that draws away, controls your life, that's the thing that you trust, you place your security in. Instead of trusting God, you trust those idols. That, those are your idols. And God is saying you need to separate yourself from it. You need to remove it. But you may say, yes, I am very motivated to do so. But is, it, is that the case? Because many of us who were Christians for a long time, you know, initially when we become Christians, we're so excited about God. You say, yes, Lord, remove all my idols. Yes, I'm going to give away my career. Not to, I mean, to, sec to put my career, not to give away, put my career under the cross of Jesus. Lord, if you call me a missionary, I'll do so. But after we, we attend prayer meetings, we attend every sort of Christian meeting as a, as a new Christian. The Bible bursts into life. But years later, decades roll by, and suddenly, you know, our enthusiasm for God, our desire to be separate becomes less and less so. We can become pew warmers. We start to think that the Bible becomes really boring. I've read that so many times. Even the pages are worn. There was this story of this Indian chief, you know, he was sharing his wisdom to a group of young braves. And um, he was sharing about the struggle that goes inside his heart. He said it's like two dogs fighting inside of us. The chief would tell these young braves 
there is a good dog that wants to do right. And there is the other dog, always want to do wrong. And these two dogs keep fighting inside the human heart. Sometimes a good dog seems to be stronger and win. Other times a bad dog will win and do the bad things. So one young brave asks, he says, then chief, who's going to win in the end? And the chief answered, the one you feed will win. The one you feed. Is that not true? That there is not contest of desires. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God fights against the spirit of our flesh. Our flesh. And our flesh fights against the Spirit of God. And it's up to us to depend what we feed. Personally, I think it's slightly unfair, that description, because I think it's a little bit tilted. Uh, because we have a, a patch um, that Solan, my wife, used to plant vegetables at the back of our garden. Now she has no time to do it anymore. Anyway, uh, so if you want to plant, you have to, first of all, you know, take the weed out. You have to um, dig up the soil and so on, put fertilizers in, and then you start to plant the seeds of vegetables, bok choy and onions and whatever you want to plant. And you have to make sure that you water those plants before, especially during summer when there, there can be drought. Only then will you see plants grow, right? You need discipline for that to happen, to be fruitful. That's why we have spiritual disciplines, to help us to shape our character, uh, to, to get us to, be, uh, to become the person that God wants us to be. But if I were to say, I want weeds to be in my garden, do I need to do anything? Nothing. I just sit back. I guarantee you, you know, a year later, you're all covered with weeds. So you see that we need to put in discipline to deal with areas in our lives that God wants to help us. But we need to be motivated, right? Because, as I've said, we all know that, yes, I need to do the discipline. Yes, I need to be separate from the world. But it's so hard. It's like those two dogs fighting inside me. It is hard. I need motivation. And I like that motivation as a Christian, especially I've been a Christian for so many years. So what is that motivation? And that motivation comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It is the fear of God. It is the fear of God that serves as a motivation, that is the key for us to keep going on, to keep going ahead and not give up. So how does that work? First, we understand that the fear of God is a positive type of reverence, right? And, and knowing God. But if you read those previous verses, you will find that God says two things that motivate this. God, uh, Paul talks about the promises. Because of these promises, he said, right? Because of these promises, therefore bring holiness to completion. Because of these promises, therefore perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So the fear of God actually points towards those, two prom- those promises which were, we read earlier on. The first one is that God dwelling with us. That should be our, our first motivation. What did the Lord say in those verses that we read? He said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Those verses were actually found in the Old Testament. When God made a special covenant with the people of Israel, when they were taken out of Egypt, do you know the whole problem of the, the fall of Adam and Eve was that they lost the presence of God. They were exiled, chick, uh, chucked out of the Garden of Eden. But God, in His love, continued to, you know, to work out His plan of salvation. So He chose Israel as His nation. And so He made that covenant to say, Israel, I have taken you out of Egypt. But if you were to obey me, these are my laws I've given to Moses. You follow all those ritualistic laws. Animals have to be sacrificed because of your sin. All right? In one sense, it's a, a shadow of what is to come to Jesus. Then I will look after you. I'll give you your land. I'll make sure that you have victory over your enemies. None of the diseases of Egypt will come near you. I'll provide rain so that you'll be fruitful in the land. I will make sure that you have your fruitful in your body. I'll give you peace. I'll give you health. I'll give you prosperity. These are the promises of God to the people of Israel. But do you know that we who are not, you know, the, obviously not Jewish, we have that. In here, in 2 Corinthians 6, that God says, I will walk among you. 
And what does it mean that God walks among you? It means that God is involved in our lives. He's not static. He's dynamic. He's walking among you. He's going to visit, right? If I say the boss is walking around in the office and you are one of the employees, what do we do? You suddenly wake up, right? Because the boss may be behind me. It means that God is interested in your life. I will be their God. You will be my people. And God is not there as a celestial policeman to beat you on the head. You see, you, see, you naughty boy? No. He's there in order to be involved in our lives. And this is made possible because of what Jesus had done for us. Right? Because in the past, the Jews have to sacrifice animals before they can have this privilege of God walking and living among us. But we have this privilege today. That should be an incentive. Because Jesus himself has paid the price to make it possible that when he died on the cross, the, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, symbolizing that a barrier between the holy God and sinful man has been broken, has been torn away so that man can approach God. This is a good news for those of you who have yet to come to know Jesus. And Jesus himself, unlike the ermine, you know, who was hunted down, unwillingly to, to keep, give their lives, to, 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 become, to be sewn into the, the rope of this emperor, or we saw this now, or the head of state. Jesus himself was a willing, a sacrificial lamb. So that we are clothed with his righteousness. Like the king, you know, we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus who willingly, willingly, unlike the ermine, gave his life for us. So, this is a desire of God, that he wants to live among us, just like the Garden of Eden to be restored again. That should be our incentive, to say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to have that fellowship with you. The second motivation is that he is a father. Because in the verses, just at the end of chapter 6, he said, I will be your father and you will be sons and daughters. Now, that should be a great motivation because a father is one who would protect us, who would care for us, and he will be the one who will draw the best out of you and me to be the person that he wants us to be. Now, some of you may have very bad experience with father. You say, oh, my father never listened to me. Dad, are you listening? Dad, are you listening? You know, some of my, daughter, my two daughters always say about me. But this dad will always listen. He delights in the prayers of his people. In fact, he delights those who fear him in, Psalm, um, in one of the Psalms. And he says, I will welcome you. You see, the father, what does the father do? Really, a good father is the one who gives you an identity. To say, you're my son, you're my daughter. Don't worry what people think about you. Whether you're ugly or, or beautiful, clever or not, makes no difference to me. I love you. You are my beloved son and daughter. That's an identity that God gives as a father to us. Well, we, we try to get approval from men, don't we? You say, oh, am I looking good? What's my hair like, you know? Well, I don't have a problem with that, but anyway. But, you know, you, 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 you look for that sort of affirmation. Am I accepted? But when you know God, doesn't, don't worry, God accepts you. That's security, significance. God, the Father gives you significance. And God, the Father says, I give you brothers and sisters as well, Right? sons and daughters, which means that God used use a community of faith to affirm, to guard, to protect, to love. And 1 John say, even as God himself has loved you, therefore love one another. This is part and parcel of us becoming holy. Not to despise people, but to be separate because that is the one thing that pleases God. And we can draw close to God because he's a father that is so gracious. He has given his son when Abram sacrificed Isaac, God says, stop, all right? Because he knows it's so much for Abram to take that step of faith. But God the Father himself was willing to do what Abram did not do, to sacrifice his son Isaac. So that he is like that ermine, but all, like the willing lamb of God, give up his life so that we can be clothed in the righteousness. So we should be really awed, not just by God's greatness, his glory, his, his wisdom, his power, but we should be Overwhelmed by, with gratitude of what God himself has done for us in Jesus Christ. And sometimes in, in our walk with God, we, we feel a little bit 
you know, discouraged because uh, things don't happen the way. But God says, as a father, I do reprove. I do discipline you. This is part and parcel of that package that I will be your God, you are my people. I'm your father, you are my son and daughter. He said, because I love you, so I discipline you. Many of the things you ask, he may say no, because it is not part of what is good to make us become holy. So don't be put off by that, but draw close to the Father. Therefore, the fear of God is about knowing God. It's about pursuing God. It's about embracing the intimacy of God. Do you know, we need to draw near to God because God says, I welcome you, just as the prodigal son. Remember, at the distance, the father saw the son coming back. He welcomed the son. He ran and kissed the son and, and gave a ring to the prodigal son and, and have a party to celebrate. And that is the sort of God that is so keen on each one of us. So draw near to God, just as Moses himself. You know, he saw the burning bush. He saw the burning bush. And he said, oh, how come this bush is not consumed? So he went, he came near, near to the bush and he heard the voice coming out of the bush say, Moses, Moses. So he said, who's this? He said, as he comes nearer, he said, now, remove your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. This is part and parcel of us perfecting holiness. That as we draw near to God, we suddenly say, wow, I'm now standing on holy ground. Remove your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. This is how we grow to become more incentivized to become holy, is to know God. And what happened to Moses? He said, when, when God says, now go and deliver uh, my people Israel from the Pharaoh, he said, I'm not, I cannot speak, I stammer. You see, God often gives us an assignment bigger than yourself. It's good that you suddenly realize you're not adequate. Because then you will start to know how powerful God is. The same applies to Isaiah. We sang Isaiah chapter 6. I'm so glad. He was already a prophet from chapter 1. And when he comes to chapter 6, suddenly he saw the vision of God. And what did he say? He said, woe to me. I'm gone. I'm, I'm a goner. I'm dead. I've seen, the, I've seen God and I'm a man of unclean lips. What is he talking about? He's a prophet of God. What is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God. His mouth, his lips are used mightily by God. But the first thing he realized as he saw the vision of God is that he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among the people unclean lips. I'm done. I'm done. I'm undone, he said. And what happened? The seraphim came and put a coal, a burning coal, and said, you're cleansed. You see, as we go nearer to God, we suddenly realize that in the presence of this majestic holy God, there's so much sin in my life. And yet it is not something that he shies away from or being repelled by this fear of God. In fact, he is attracted to it. And what happened? That God gave him a greater assignment. Right? Prophesy more. And if you look at the Bible, Isaiah is the thickest book in terms of all the prophets. And he wrote about the coming Messiah and so on. This is the way God wants us to draw near, to know him. What stops Paul from, you know, what, what keeps him going? To, despite the uh, imprisonment and, and, and uh, beatings and betrayal and all that, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to know Christ. This is what keeps him going in Philippians 3.10. So there is an attraction for us to be holy, but we need to pursue God. We need to embrace the fear of God, the reverential awe, the gratitude of what the amazing love that God has for us. And that is our incentive. You see, very often, after a number of years, we Christians start to just do the works of God. Oh, I'm, it's good, I, I serve in the church. Yes, I'll do this, I'll do that. All this is good. But it is the walk of God that's important. It's the walk of God that sustains the work of God. Otherwise, you become dry. And so God is incentivizing us to say that these promises is that I am your God. You are my people. And secondly, I'm your father. You are my son and my daughter. And I will draw the best out of you, more than you think. Just as Moses said, oh, not for me, you know. I have enough of Egypt. No, 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 you be the deliverer. Just as Isaiah, oh, I'm dead. No, Isaiah, go and preach. That's the way God wants us 
But many of us say, no, it's not for me, it's, it's for the, I'm not that spiritual. No, oh, it's for this person, no, it's for this person, it's for the, the mission task force. No, why? Because you have not motivated enough to draw near to the burning bush. If you draw near to the burning bush of God, you'll be attracted. Look at the disciples walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. They say, our hearts warm as this stranger opens, talks about the things. They could not recognize Jesus. They said, oh, please stay, have dinner with us. And Jesus stayed, right? Why? Because they are attracted by the presence of God. We need to rediscover again the presence of God. We need to hang on to the promises. I'm not telling you something that is just my good idea. It's in the Word of God. Paul says, because of these promises, you have to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Because of these promises, you have to bring uh, holiness to completion in the reverence of God. So, let us seek the reverence of God. Let us know that the Lord who stretched the whole heavens right to the end, at the age of the universe, wherever that ends, is also the Lord who is so near to you that He knows your thoughts. He knows the word that's about to come out of your mouth. It is that near to you. He said, I know you, in Psalm 139. The psalmist says, O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You see, God knows you. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you completely, you know it completely, O Lord. In Psalm 147, verse 10, the Lord delights in those who fear Him, who put their hope in His unfailing love. The Lord delights over all of us. I'm glad the prophetic word, uh, May came and, and brought, it, brought it to me. It's about the Lord singing over us. He is delighted over us. So do not make God to be like your father. I thank God many of our fathers are good fathers, but obviously not perfect. Some may have poor fathers. Some may have absent fathers. No fathers. But come to know God as this amazing and awesome father. And you'll find that your life will be transformed. You will be taken to adventures of faith that you never come across before. And learn to worship God. So that when we study God's word, when we open God's word, sometimes we just say, what's it in it for me? But actually the word of God is to point towards Jesus. Jesus say, the scriptures talk about me. So the next time when we study God's word, you must always, always ask, what can I learn about God? What can I learn to worship Him, to draw near to Him, to stand on His character, that He is the holy God, He is the summation of all the perfection of all His attributes. What can I stand to do that? You know, A.W. Tozer was a man who was not academically that qualified, but yet he wrote many inspiring books. And uh, he really draws out, you know, the, his walk and the reality of God in his life. And he was used by God mightily. He was a pastor of a church and so on. But do you know that every morning, and this was a friend, I suppose, who noticed him, he would sprawl himself face downwards on the floor, just worshipping God, not asking anything, just to be awed by the presence of God. It's a bit like the Grand Canyon, all right? The Grand Canyon is just a very mind, a small description. Just, I was there just looking at the beauty, at the colours of the Grand Canyon. The same way is that we should draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So God delights over us. We have that assurance, that promises. And that's the one thing that helps us to put away our idols. When our idols start to pop out in the house, and say, no, you're not that important, not that precious. God is my security. God can be trusted. God can satisfy my needs. God is the one that, you know, that gives me my, my security, my significance. God is the one that I serve, not the idols. But you know that it's too dark. If you do not look after if you do not pursue God, if you do not look after God, then the idols will, will take over your heart. And this is the battle that we're in. All right? But he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. So in that sense, we have an advantage. And finally, I want to conclude that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, 18, remember Paul says, and all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of God is being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. How do you behold God if you do not seek Him, if you do not spend time meditating on His goodness? Look to your life and say, God, I can see you there. I can see you intervening in my life. I can see you that major event in my life. I thank you, Lord, for you know, my family members. I thank you for even small mercies. And this is how you develop to have great thoughts of God. This is how you worship God. Think 
and reflect in our lives. So that we can be like the saint says, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honour, power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So let's spend a moment just to reflect over what has been shared and uh, the Word of God to stir in us that desire to say, I want to, that fear of God because I want to see myself to become more and more like Jesus, to bring holiness to His completion, to bring delight to my Father. So let's uh, bow our heads and just reflect over the next few minutes and uh, ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Lord, we thank you that you caused you so much to come into this world. We feel sorry for those uh, little ermines who we killed and so on. But Lord, when we think about you being the perfect son of God, that you will reviled, you will abuse, you will torture. But you see that, Lord, as, as a joy for you to see us to be saved. So Lord, what an amazing grace that we are confronted with. So that, Lord, you can claim back to draw us, Lord, with your love that we are your people, you are our God. Thank you, after all, that you are our creator. You're the one that makes us in the first place. But we have to sin, walked away from you, even born in sin because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Lord, what a privilege to be your children. What a privilege, Lord, to know you as the great I am. And Lord, you welcome us. You do not despise us. You do not reject us. You welcome us just as we are. On the very day we accepted you, you put in your Holy Spirit. You declare us to be saints, to be holy, separated for you. Thank you that, Lord, you have given, Lord, so all that you have for us. Help us, Father, to really, Lord, turn our hearts to you. Turn our hearts away from every form of idolatry. Lord, every temptation, the Lord, we will perfect holiness in the fear of God. Thank you for being a father to us. Thank you that you welcome us in open arms. Help us to be secure in that love expressed through Jesus Christ, that we will come to you rather than to shy away from you. I just sense that God does not want to condemn us. You know, he, you may have done some bad things, even in this week. But God says, come to me. Just like the prodigal son, you know, he knows that in him, he's, he's going to just squander his life. 
But he suddenly realized that I don't care whatever happens, I must go back to my father's home. So come home. Come home. That's what the Lord will say to you. Come, come back home. Come to him. Thank you, Jesus. So Lord, as we um, end the service, we just uh, pray, Lord, for your protection and blessing to create in us, Lord, a thirst for you, to pursue you. Thank you, Lord. And as we do so, Lord, we are transformed. Your word says we are transformed from glory to glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your promises that tend to us. In Jesus' name, amen. And maybe some of you may not be a Christian today. I must give you the opportunity to say, you know, that God also extends His welcome to you. But of course, you have to count your costs. You have to forsake. You know what? Maybe your idols, not maybe your dreams. Because God says, I am your greatest treasure. And if that's you, you know, you count your cost or you want to ask some questions. If that's you, just raise your hand so that I can talk to you afterwards. All right? If there's any one of us here, you know, don't be shy. This is a safe place. Just put up your hand and I, we can talk to you afterwards. All right? Just very quickly. So before we sing the last song, is there anyone? Just raise your hand briefly. I'll identify you. I won't embarrass you. All right? Is there, no, is there anyone? Okay. We're going to sing the first last song. Okay, let's all stand as we sing the last song.